Well, this is episode eight with Jim Duckworth. Um, well, let's start off with uh, where'd you grow up and how'd you get into like blues, psych, rock and roll, like the whole punk Billy playing guitar and drums and stuff. Okay, well, um, I was born in Atlanta, but I moved around a lot. And ended up in Memphis when I was about fourteen, mm-hmm. and that that's pretty much where I was. Other than when I uh, went to college. Um, that's pretty much where I was. I've been ever since. Um, and, you know, I always liked music. Yeah. Um, when I was, you know, I'm 61, so it would have been the Beatles and Jimi Hendrix and stuff that I really was listening to as a kid. Mm-hmm. Right. And, um, well, how did you meet uh, Tav Falco and join the Panther Bird? Okay. Um, so, um, um, in Memphis, there's a club called Well, um, which was like where uh, bands played that did not fit into the sort of normal categorization of bands. Most bands, uh, before punk rock, uh, when a band worked, it was because they were like a uh, pale imitation of the, the big bands that played at the Coliseums and the and Normo Domes and stuff. Um, but the main thing that punk rock did was make you appreciate your local band and expect some degree of originality out of them. And that's what was happening here. So there was this club called The Well that some bands would play at um, and part of this burgeoning Memphis uh, punk scene. And I played one night. I was playing with this band where I played drums and guitar. And uh, I'd been playing drums all night. And the singer turned around and said, you play guitar. Well, I couldn't. My fingers were all blistered up. But he made me do it. So I got up and played. When I was done, some female comes up to me and says, Alex loves your drumming and guitar playing. And she was, of course, talking about Alex Chilton, whom I met at that time and started hanging out with. Mm-hmm. And we used to hang out and talk and drink a lot and that sort of thing back back in those days. Um, and he was playing in Panther Burns and eventually pulled me in uh, to that group. Mm-hmm. And that's how I got into that one. Oh, okay. Because uh, you switched from lead guitar to drums and then back again and lead guitar, right? Well, I just thought, you know, it was punk rock. I thought, well, you know, uh, I, I was watching a band. Actually, I was talking to some friends of mine in a band. Their drummer didn't show up. They got somebody else. And uh, I told them, I could do better than that. And so that's how, <laughs> I, that's how I ended up drumming. Right. What kind of crowds usually attended uh, Panther Burn shows? Was it mostly rockabillies or punk? Too, well, there was really it was. Let me the um, Memphis burgeoning Memphis punk scene was pretty parochial. Um, bands that were just weird um, and didn't really fit, like I say, in this sort of cover band sort of mentality that still exists here, um, um, would just play there because there was no place else for these weird ass bands to play. So it was at first the scene was pretty unique in that um, it wasn't like this is punk, this is rockabilly, this is something. It's just whatever you did, people expected it to be different and a little bit weird here. Um, and so just the people who went to that club were the people who went to see uh, the Panther Burns play. First time I saw the Panther Burns play was in December 1980. Uh, and um, a friend of mine took me. And as I was walking down the street right by the club, you could hear all this fucking squealing and shrieking. Uh, can I use profanity? Oh, are, we yeah. a, are we in a broadcast oh, yeah. situation? <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Um, and it was this, I was walking to this club, and it was, all I could hear was this fucking shrieking feedback. Not feedback like a controlled note, not like Jeff Beck or something like that, but feedback like um, just cheap guitars close to too close to big-ass loud amps. And, huh. and it turns out there was a synthesizer, a monophonic synthesizer, too, and this squealing just was incessant, and then they'd, songs would seem to break out. I'm in between, um, and it was it was amazing. It was fucking great. Um, yeah. um, it was it was one of the. I laughed. Um, you know, I really liked it. So I was, it was it was kind of exciting to me. Yeah. Um, like I said, I I got to, I met Chilton right around that time um, and started hanging out with him, listening to records, and talking about stuff. I ended up going on a tour with him. And that's where I met Jim Scovunas in 1981. We went to the East Coast, and he didn't play guitar. He just had me playing guitar uh, for him at that time. All right, but the question was, what kind of people would come to 
receive it. Uh, and um, typically, it was just the people who went to this club, you know, because there was really not much crossover between any other um, clubs and what was going on in this one little punky place that later became uh, known as the Ant- changed names became the Antenna. And was, I think, one of the longest-running punk clubs in the country, I think, mm. um, one of them. And um, so it was just the people who went to that club, mainly. Uh, there weren't many outsiders. It wasn't like the, at that time, it, there wasn't really a rockabilly fringe or contingent or anything like that. Okay. Very cool. Uh, what drove the band to make different music at the time, uh, like records like Behind the Magnolia Curtain? Sure. Yeah. Uh, what What do you want to know about that one? Um, like what What drove the band to to make like that different sound? Oh, dude, it, it, it was all random, you know. Um, largely, they did bring in that drum corps from Tate County. Um, a guy named Dr. David Evans. They worked with him. He brought him in. Uh, Jesse May Hemphill was in that in that band. And there was uh, bass drum. Of course, we're talking about standing. Um, and two snares, and I was a drummer, guitar player. I played guitar on some things on that and drums on others. But where you hear them, I'm always playing drums, and I lined up sort of in front of them with my bass, snare, and wide cymbal, and uh, we played together, warming up. And Jesse McHenthal goes, sounds like Africa. <laughs> uh, it wasn't like planned. Is this this thing happen, you know? Um, uh it, and it was loose in the studio. Um, and what else do I remember about that? It was over two days. It was cut live. There's no overdubs or anything like that. Oh, okay. Uh, and were those shows pretty tame, uh, Panzerbird shows? Um, no, but they were pretty erratic. Uh, so after the time I saw them in December of 80 that I liked them so much, I couldn't wait to see them again, so I fucking got down there right away to the next show, but the next show didn't happen. <laughs> it, was oh, just, it was just, I don't know, the energy wasn't there, something, so it was It was pretty hit or miss. Um, right. So it got out of hand a lot, or no? Sometimes it could be pretty exciting, and then um, other times it would be pretty pretty bland. Did you uh, play that anti-nuclear rally with Alan Ginsberg at the Peppermint Lounge in New York City? So ask me about the peppermint lounge again. What did you play that gig? That that rally with Allen Ginsberg? Um, probably. I played. I remember working with Allen Ginsberg a couple of times. Um, uh, I don't know which gig exactly you're talking about. I know we played with. He had, you know, he had his he had his sort of Zen rock band with him. Um, yeah, it was some kind of uh, anti-nuclear rally. Did we? It's possible. Um, if it was, if it was between eighty and eighty, late eighty two, then it was, I probably, then I probably did. Okay, cool. Do you remember anything about him or Ginsburg? Yeah, yeah um, I, you know, I was such a dick when I was a young guy um, <laughs> that I thought I was just going to meet everybody I'd ever heard of because I would keep meeting these people. That one day I'm meeting Wayne Kramer from the MC Five and. Wildman Fisher, and so I'm just thinking, well, I'm going to meet everybody I ever heard of. And one day I'm, tu- I'm tuning Gus's guitar, and that's, that's Tab Falco, I'm tuning his guitar backstage at the Peppermint Lounge, and I look up, and there's Allen Ginsberg, he says, I'm Allen Ginsberg. And, um, I told him that I knew that. I don't know, I was such a dick. But he was very, <laughs> <laughs> he was very pleasant. Um, right on. And you guys opened for the Cramps, right? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Played with the Cramps a bunch of times in New York. And then first time I was in Los Angeles, we went out west, and that was the Cramps for headline. We were playing on Halloween, if I didn't say that already. Halloween at Devonshire Downs in Los Angeles. Wow. And Vampi- Vampira was on, on that game. Whoa, nice. But... But Van, well, Vampire was a big disappointment um, to really? everybody because she wasn't doing anything. And apparently, mm. and this, I, I can't, I can't attest to this, but I think their complaint was she wasn't talking to anybody. But she picked me out and would talk to me for some reason. I don't know mm. why. Um, uh-huh. 
but she nice. didn't do much on her act. I think she just laid in the coffin or some bullshit like that. It's hard to pull it back now. <laughs> but they had some complaint um, about her. And then we played together in San Francisco. This time we'd play with the Gun Club as well on the bill. Mm. And then, of course, through the 80s, played the Peppermint Lounge with the Cramps a few times um, as well. Okay. So, yeah, there's a few times like that. And how was your relationship off stage with the Cramps? Did you guys hang out with them? A, a bit. Um, I, they were all real nice, the ones that I talked to. Um, um, we hung out, me and Skalunas hung out with Kid Conga more than um, Lux and Ivy. But he was very nice, very pleasant. Um, and I always found them easy to talk to as well. Cool, cool. At the time, did you notice uh, your influence on, like, the Southern Gothic Hinge Roots music revival scene at the time? At the time, did I notice any impact on what we, from what we were doing? Is that right. right? Yeah. Um, God, no. <laughs> Not really, no. Um, uh, let's I guess, you know, um, there are really not many bands uh, locally now doing anything with roots music. There's a couple. Um, but right. it's certainly the, the punk elements, uh, the, you know, the way I got it was like this. Um, the way I got into that sort of music is Alex Chilton had a record called Light Flies on Sherber. Mm-hmm. And I, I listened to the shit out of that record. And at that time, I wasn't listening to the Carter family or Ernest Tubb or Jimmy C. Newman, or any of that stuff but that Chilton was covering on. It was all new to me. So this roots music, um, you know, uh, rockabilly and country and blues and stuff, sounded real fresh and real strong. I was familiar with blues, but, you know, from being very young. But uh, I never had listened to much country music until I got to be about, you know, 19. And uh, never listened to Carter Family or Jimmy Rogers or anything until... This sort of roots, you know, I think that Chilton would be the one that really, I think, that pioneered this thing, doing that roots music, doing um, our forefathers and um, uh, right. bringing it up today. Okay. And how important was style to you? Style? Yeah. Um, as in, we're talking about musical styles? Uh, dress? Musical style, you know, the the type of guitar you use. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Um, I used a real big Gibson at that time, a big, thick-ass 175. Um, and one time somebody asked me, they said, don't you, these guys in New York said, well, don't you have a problem with feedback? And I said, no, I get all the feedback I want. Um, yeah. So um, as long as, you know, at that time... You know, it's hard for me to relate to my younger self entirely, but I think I wanted everything to sound kind of rootsy, like a cross between the Elvis Sun Sessions and White Light, White Heat, or something like that. Uh, uh, <laughs> Great. And why did you leave uh, Panther Birds? Oh, oh. Um, well, they wouldn't consider original material, and I just kind of got embarrassed by the fact that we weren't playing anything original. Mm. Um, Sklavunas, I bought him a tune, but he wouldn't um, consider it, and it just kind of bugged me. So um, I told the booking agent in November of 82 that I wasn't going to be working with that group anymore, and he also booked a gun club. He said, hold on, I might have something for you, and the next Mm. thing I know, he got me into gun club. Nice. Yeah, I was going to say, um, how did you first meet Jeffrey Lee Pierce, and what was your impression of him the first time you met him? Um, when I first met him? Yeah. When I first met him, yeah, we were playing in San Francisco, um, and uh, Sklavunas and I were hanging out and laughing about some shit. We were always laughing about some shit. And he came in drinking some crappy ass, it was, this was sound check, some crappy ass cold stuff like you could buy at the fucking convenience store. Um, and he thought we were laughing at him because, you know, he's, he's a sensitive fella, um, Jeffrey was. Um, and he yelled some bullshit at us, which made us laugh harder. Um, <laughs> we, we played a gig with just the gun club and the Panther Burns at a place called The Sound of Music in San Francisco. And when we got to the end of the night, it was decided they could only pay one band. 
And mm-hmm. since we were from a fuck ton farther away than um, the gun club, uh, we got the money. And the last yeah. thing I saw, the last thing I saw as I was leaving was Jeffrey turned over a table in the club. And I kind of figured I wouldn't be seeing him much anymore. But um, I, saw him, I saw him in New York opening for the cramps, and I'd talked to him. He was always real, real pleasant with me. Um, but, you know, Jeffrey had some uh, demons, I guess you would know. Um, I think that's probably common knowledge now, yeah? Yeah. He had some issues. Okay. Oh, yeah. He had some, <laughs> he had some issues uh, with, uh, you know, not really drugs and alcohol, because the problem was he would drink, but he just wasn't very good at it. Um, uh, I, when I hung out with children, you know, we'd stay up all night drinking, and then the 7-Eleven opened up, we'd go buy beer there and drink some more and but when jeffrey drank a lot he immediately had sort of a personality change and um uh, he would either be crying or something and i we just thought that was terrible form this is bad form but i asked i asked terry graham about this i said well terry this was years later i said terry you know when i was when i knew jeffrey he couldn't drink or use junk with the fuck um, but, you know, all I ever heard later was that he was such an alcoholic junkie. So what happened? And he goes, well, you do anything long enough, you're going to get good at it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's true. Um, did he bombard you with his love for Blondie? No, he kept that shit quiet. Although once we were listening to Big Star's third in a car, and he said it sounded like Blondie. He was kind of being dismissive. Um and I don't know what on Big Star Third sounded like Blondie, but it's just some shit he said. Now, when I I would try and get down with um, from him, I figured he knew more about that blues shit than I did because you know I didn't know Tommy Johnson um, and I didn't know the Carolina Tar Heels and I didn't know a lot of stuff. And back then, you know, in the days of vinyl before the internet, it was much more difficult to chase down everything you wanted to hear or needed to hear or would like to check out. So I go to this place. I would really give him, you know, say, "Hey, play, play me some uh, Carolina Tar Heels." Say, "Play Charlie Poole and the North Carolina Rambles, or whatever the fuck it was I wanted to hear at that time. Play Tom Johnson, and at that time he was really more into Prince and Michael Jackson. Mm. Um, but I played him some, you know, I listened to all that jazz shit. I played him some late John Coltrane stuff, and he really got into that pretty good. Um, nice, cool. And what were uh, gun club practices like? Um, they were uh, he rehearsed the band okay. Um, I'm trying to remember. I don't remember a lot of rehearsals. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, Is there a lot of drinking? Probably some. I remember one where uh, the drummer, one of the drummers we worked with. And it wasn't Terry. Um, Patricia found a hit of tab of acid in her base case. And so he just took that shit. He just took that shit right there on the spot um, that morning. Wow. And um, it was it was a weird fucking rehearsal. I'll say that. Um, <laughs> what about the recording of Death Party? How did that go? Well, and how did that go? We weren't, well, I really didn't know we were about to do it. There was a text in the Horseheads recording session booked, and for some reason it didn't happen. And the next thing you know, I'm getting a call in Memphis telling me to make it up there that night, and we're going to start recording. So I think I got up there the next day and rehearsed with Jeffrey. He showed me these songs, and we rehearsed at a place in Chinatown um, in lower Manhattan and went in the studio a day or so later um, and started trying to kick these tunes out. Mm-hmm. Okay. Did Did you approach being in Gun Club with a different guitar style since you were the lead, like lead guitarist? No, this uh, you know I can only do what I what I I do. And really, when I had seen the band all the times I'd seen it before, they had Ward Dotson, whose style was really more appropriate to the band. It was more architectural. It was more. Uh, it wasn't ornamental, if you know what I mean. Um, he played really foundational good sounding guitar for that band um, on a telecaster when I saw them, the times mm-hmm. I saw them. And I get in there, and I can only do what I do. And so I um, was a little, I was a little uh, overwhelming. You know, I was loud, playing a big-ass kitchen, um, playing solos and shit, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Yeah. So I just do, I can only do what I do. Um, right <laughs> even, to this day, <laughs> even to this day. Um, and you played a Gibson when you were with the gun club. Uh, what did Jeff right. I'm sorry, I missed the end of that. Oh, uh, what did what kind of guitar did Jeffrey play? Did he play Gibson? Too he did not. Something? He didn't. He, he didn't play guitar. Um, if he, oh. he overdubbed, he overdubbed something on the record. He used my guitar. Oh, that's right, because he said he he couldn't really play guitar well, right? Yeah, he's actually very good. Um, yeah, I've heard him say that before, um, and I was like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> yeah, he's he was very good. He understood that sort of. I don't know, he listened to a lot of um, that sort of finger-picking ragtime, ragtime style, like Blind Blake or and stuff like that. Um, okay. And what was touring like with the gun club for that year? It was it was pretty fucked up. Um, <laughs> uh, it was fun, though. Um, it was fun. Um, uh, we had a lot of laughs. Um, yeah. We when we played the East Coast for about three weeks and went to Europe for about two months, and then we did a United States tour on airplanes, and yeah. um, that was about the last things I remember doing. Um, yeah. So what, I mean, what was it like being in a band with Jeffrey Lee Pierce? Well, Art? you know, I, it was um, usually it was pretty good. Um, he he would use you pretty good. Um, but like I say, he got kind of shitty when he drank. Um, and that wasn't all the time. That was just sometimes. Um, normally, I, I don't really remember a whole lot of issues, or I don't remember it as being fraught with difficulty, um, more, any more so than um, I would blame myself because, you know, I was young and I was doing all kinds of shit back right. then. You know, I was doing um, certainly um, drinking and drugging um, as much, if not more, than, than, than Jeffrey. Um, huh. So I would probably have, you know, if I was in a band, if I was in a band with me now when I was that age, I would definitely kick me out right away. So, uh, <laughs> what about with Patricia Morrison? She was very easy to get along with. Um, we roomed in that band because my my hygiene was uh, more acceptable. I'm not saying it was acceptable. It was just more acceptable than, than um, the other guys in the band. I found her very easy to deal with. She wasn't really a musician musician, you know. Um, right. We, we played a gig in Philadelphia that Jeffrey didn't make. D has a, D has a video of this somewhere um, where D sang lead and Ben, since D was too drunk to walk, Ben Vaughn and some other guy played drums with us. But all she knew was the tunes in the gun club that she had kind of learned by road. It's not like she had a body of material or she could play a blues or anything like that. She was, she was really more into you know, the fashion aspect um, okay. of it, um, the right. scene aspect of it. Um, far, it, it, much different approach than I took. You know, I, um, okay. yeah. I was very unfashionable to this and, to, and so very much to this day. Um, but, you know, she always, you know, had a look and that sort of thing. Of course, you know, when you saw her off stage before she poofed her hair out and put on all that um, vampire-esque makeup, you know, she looked really, really normal. <laughs> right. Looked and like um, be a bank teller or something, you know. <laughs> well, uh, why didn't she play on Death Party? Um, I don't – well, they just called it in. It was like I say, it happened real quick. I don't know who if they knew. I don't. I, I'm not really. I've talked to Terry about it, but I'm not really sure how that breakup went with with Terry and Ward and her the last version of the band before I joined. So I don't know if she was even in or what at that point. Um, but this guy named Jimmy Joe Yolano, uh, a friend of Dee's, played bass. Um, and uh, like I said, I think it had more to do with the, that thing came up so quickly. It was okay. kind of forced to happen because there was a cancellation. Okay. I thought maybe she was trapped in L.A. and there was no plane or something. I don't know. But, uh, you'd have to ask her about that. I <laughs> don't yeah. no, I, I couldn't really say. Okay. Uh, what influenced the song House on Highland Ave? Isn't it about like a serial killer or something? Murder? I don't – I'll say this. I'll say this. Um, that's what Chris Stein asked him in the studio. But what's this about, a serial killer? 
and Jeffrey gave him some bullshit. So apparently, as if that, that was far from the case, although that's certainly what it sounds like to me. Yeah. Um, Why weren't you guys in the video? Oh, they they did that separate. Um, after the recording, I went back to Memphis to wait for the next thing to happen, and um, he was still hanging out with Tex, um, and they made the video mm. in a hotel room or some shit or whatever the fuck they did. It cost ten thousand bucks. Wow! For the hotel <laughs> for that little hotel room. <laughs> yeah, that that thing cost ten k, dude. Um, wow. That's crazy. And it, well, that's what they were charged anyway, and I think there's sort of, um, I think there were certain, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, certain uh, uh, inconsistencies in the money um, that um, that um, that's what caused a lot of people to have, that's what caused me to have a problem in the band. I yeah. thought the money was weird. Yeah. And what about the song Lie? What was that about? Lie. Uh, oh, the lie. The, the uh, lie. I have, yeah, I have no fucking idea. Somebody's asked me, you're the first person to ask me what Jeffrey's songs mean, but the last time I had this conversation uh, was back when I was in the group, and a couple friends of mine uh, asked me, what are those songs about? <laughs> and, and I and I said, jerking off, because that seems to be about as close as I can come to it. But to be honest, I would not put myself in a position to claim to know what any of his songs were about. I, I think his work was really, really uh, original, really great. Um, I particularly like, you know, Fire of Love. I think that was a really good record. Um, yeah. And I really liked Miami. I thought that was a really good record. Yeah. Um, and I thought he had some really great songs. Um, I do I, one I do know about um, mm-hmm. before my time is Texas Serenade. I know that's about his uncle, mm-hmm. um, but yeah. how actual that is, you'd have to ask. I'd have to ask his sister Jackie about that, but um, mm-hmm. she'd probably have more insight on that. Um, okay. But no, I was, I'm not the one to tell you what his songs are about. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. So then you don't know what Death Party, the self-titled song, is about, or Comeback Jam, huh? I think I think Death Party is a joke uh, song about a um, shitty party. I don't know. I, he we laughed a lot when he first showed it to us. He laughed too. So um, right. I, it always just struck me as sort of a goof, you know. Yeah, I kind of took it as a, a kind of like a joke about death or something. I don't know. Yeah, well, you know, two things that Jen we don't think of in the same breath, I guess. Um, Right, right. And what was your favorite Gun Club song to play of the older stuff? Do you think? Fire Let's see. Love? Um, I love playing that rock ability. Yeah, Fire of Love was fun. Um, uh, I, I'll you tell you what. I'll tell you what. When I played with him, um, I did not know about um, the Bad Man ballads. I didn't know about really the folk tradition in the way I do now. And we played John Hardy in that group, um, a Bad Man ballad, and that was an eye opener to me. Mm-hmm. And we also, um, he also showed me, um, but we never played it, Railroad Bill. Okay. Um, so I really owe him a lot for showing me these things. I can't remember which one I would like to play, which one of those songs I enjoyed playing most. I got to make a lot of noise on Death Party when we played it live. I got to, uh, <laughs> That's a great song. I got to make a lot of sound on that. Um, Right. I know you played Sex Beat Live. Yeah, we played that. Goodbye, Johnny. We play. I'm trying to remember what all we played. Fire of Love. Then you know songs from that e- the Death Party EP for the most part. And right. Cool. And uh, how was playing the Hacienda? Was Jeffrey and D were both on heroin, like passed out. Oh no 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 no! Not in England. No. Um, I know. It's, no, the Hacienda is a weird one for me. Um, uh, I have seen that one, but it's been a long time. But um, I do remember that the night before um, the Hacienda gig, D got into a drinking contest with this guy um, who owned this hotel where we were staying. And it's a little hotel, and they were, they show they show this game called spoof, and so me and this guy. Um, 
uh, hotel owner and his two daughters are you and are playing this game. And it's, it's a game that involves coins. You have anywhere from zero to three points. You put your hand on the table. You guess how many coins are, are present. If you guess correctly, you're out. The last person left in buys the round for everybody. Mm. And I kept winning. Which I thought they were, because I thought they were going to hustle me. I, because there's, you know, it's a guy and his two daughters. But I kept winning. I, I couldn't figure out exactly what was going on. I kept winning and I wasn't even, I wasn't even drinking all that shit. I was, so I would, I would give drinks to the, um, the Sisters of Mercy guys who were touring with us who didn't have any money at that time. Mm-hmm. And I got, pissed the guy off and he said, um, damn Americans can't drink. Which is oh. fine with me. It didn't hurt my feelings a bit. Um, I was willing to go with the D couldn't let that stand. So he got into a drinking contest with this guy. And they, what they did is they would take three fingers of whiskey and put it down. Then the next three fingers and put it down. And the last man standing won. And the mm-hmm. hotel owner was the last man standing on that one. But <laughs> So D got way fucked up. Um, he was pissing himself. God knows what else. Um, and when we carried him to that gig, we had him in the back of the van laying on top of the Ampeg um, SVT cabinet. And we had to have our picture made for um, NME that day. And then we played this gig, which ultimately was a video and gets around. Yeah. That's the main thing I remember from that. Um, okay. <laughs> Did you guys hang out a lot off? stage like was i mean did jeffrey go and do his own thing or um no we you know you're pretty much traveling as a team uh, when you're traveling in a, as, in a group like that um okay. you pretty much pretty much stuck together particularly as you know it was kind of insular we, we were traveling so much um we played 56 dates in about 59 days i think it was so we did a lot of traveling through europe um, and we would, of course, be together all the time, you know, on planes, on trains, and what have you. Yeah. Well, what do you think the craziest show you guys ever played was? Craziest show? Uh, probably the one without Jeffrey was pretty fucking insane. Not that I want to see it. Um, I don't know. I listen to that stuff now when I hear it, and um, it's more amusing to me than it used to be. Um, uh uh, Jeffrey's bullshit uh, seems funnier to me now than it did mm-hmm. when, when I was endu- when I was enduring it in life. Uh, it seems funnier yeah. to me now. Right. What about the worst show you played? Oh, it's, yeah, it's fairly easy. Um, I think it would have been this one in France. Um, the tour manager um, got some powerful barbiture for some condition, which he gave to all the people in the band. Um, and um, we were all just fucking out of it. Um, and I think that was probably was somewhere in France, probably one of the worst shows anybody ever played, I'm guessing. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, did you like the flow of the band better when Terry Graham joined? Yeah, Terry has a um, – I really enjoyed getting a chance to play with him. He would really give the band a lift. Um, it, was, it was really something. Um, I, I found him to be um, a very good musician. Of course, I love D too. Um, uh, did Dee. you? Uh, yeah, did you played with D for um, almost that whole eight months, right? Yeah, that's true. He was mostly in there. Yeah. Um, D almost you re- didn't go, what are you going to go to? Yeah, D almost didn't go to Europe with us because he had broken his knuckle on his uh, right hand. It, it was pushed way, way back into his hand where he'd punched some guy out. Um, and the doctor told him that he could either break it and set it correctly, which, you know, I mean his hand would be in a cast for a while, or it could heal up the way it is. And huh. he, decided, he decided to let it go and go, uh, to, go to Europe with the, with the gun club. Ouch. Uh, did did you regret regret leaving the gun club and not getting on that plane in Australia? Or? Um, kind of in a way. Now, I, of course, it, it's easy to say yeah, but at that time, we kept Terry and I kept calling the booking agent because we, the, the money was weird. The money was pretty funny. Jeffrey just, and the, the impression I had at that time, and I think that a lot of people would bear me out on this. And in Jeffrey's book, he talks about the same thing. 
Uh, he didn't give a fuck um, as long as he could get out of his mother's house, and drink and shit, and then he'd come back and live in his mother's house. Well, I didn't live in my mother's house, you know. Um, I had bills and shit. And so naturally, I wanted the money to be right. And so we're about to go to Australia, and we kept asking the booking agent, uh, well, how much are we going to make on this? And he wouldn't say, he wouldn't talk to us, wouldn't talk to us. Um, and finally, the last thing he told us was, well, if you save your per diems, you'll have something. So he wanted me to go around the world, um, and they were going to screw us on the money um, quite mm. clearly. Uh, or so it seemed to me. So Terry and I just, we, we walked on that. And now, of course, I would have done it just to go to Australia, but um, right. it, it was a it was a fucked up situation, of course. And a lot a lot of it is not. I really don't. I'm not in touch with that side of myself from back then that would that would remember exactly how how that felt. But I know that it was because the money was weird and I couldn't get a straight answer, and Jeffrey wasn't interested in getting a straight answer. Mm, right. And, uh, well, after that, you were in a couple other bands, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I still play. I've played ever since, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was about uh, to play this afternoon, actually. Um, okay. I was going to ask, what are you doing musically now? Are you in a band? Um, <laughs> yeah, I've got a band I'm really excited about right now with um, Kimberly Keeler from, from Memphis here. We do a band called Billy Dove. She's the front person, and she writes songs and stuff. And it's pretty rootsy. It's double bass, acoustic guitar, electric guitar, and drums. Cool. And, um, I'm I'm pretty uh, I'm pretty into this project. Um, we've been doing it together for about five years now. Cool. But we had a major we had a major setback last year. Um, one year ago, um, on May twelfth, we we're playing a gig, and um, the guy just made national news. A guy was in love with the sound person at the club, this woman, mm -hmm. and he set himself, he gassed himself in kerosene, set himself on fire, and came. Whoa! Out. Yeah, Jeez. and this this was some pretty serious trauma for us, um, as you can imagine. Um, yeah, and it ended up it made that version of our band uh, break up. Our rhythm section broke off and. We kind of weren't too hot to play in clubs for a while, but we're starting to come back now. Oh, okay, cool. Do you guys have a, a record out or anything? Well, we're probably going to put we're we'll probably record something in the coming weeks. Um, we had to put a new band together. <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. Right. And uh, where were you when when uh, Jeffrey Lee Pierce passed away, and how did it affect you? Um, I was in Memphis. I heard about it. Um, I was, I want, it's been 20 something years, right? Um, yeah, yeah about, about, about 20 years, I think. So, um, I don't remember being overwhelmingly sad about it. Of course, it's really unfortunate. Um, a lot of the people that I worked with, um, kind of died in their early and mid thirties, uh, for some reason. And um, I think usually it's the ones who are still using and shit. Right. <laughs> there's a time, there's a time, dude, when um, it's really time to to leave that shit behind because it. Uh, right. I, I've had so many people I know um, dead from that. Um, yeah, me as well. Yeah. Well, it's, it's it's unfortunate, and I think the thing is, you just got to come to a point when you're about I don't know in your early 30s if you're still doing that shit and just cross it off because it, that seems to be that seems to be where the problems come in. Yeah. Well, if you could say something to Jeffrey right now, what would it be? Calm the fuck down, son. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the last time I talked to him uh, was uh, 1983, 84 uh, at the Pyramid Club in New York City and he had said something when I was in the band um, about there were no great blues, country blues artists from Memphis, no, no great pre-war blues artists from Memphis, which at the time I kind of just listened. But then I, when I ran into him, I said, hey, you said that once. What about Frank Stokes? I went, oh, yeah, Frank Stokes is great. And we started singing Chicken, You Can Roost Behind the Moon together. Um, and that was the last time I remember talking to him. Okay. Yeah. I didn't tell him to calm. I didn't tell him to calm the fuck down or anything. <laughs> All right. And uh, well, do you have any last words? 
Um, hopefully, I have plenty more words to go, but no, not any last words right now. Um, yeah, great. Well, thank you, Jim Duckworth, for your time. 